You know, get good can go a long way, and the vast majority of JRPGs are pretty straightforward. Go into battle, fight, level up, get new skills, grind and farm here and there, and then you can play the game normally. But some JRPGs aren't that simple. Sometimes you'll get a JRPG with a battle system that tried to do something different, but came out as a convoluted mess, or has too many systems, or doesn't explain most of its mechanics enough, or just a JRPG that's flat out hard and unforgiving, leading you to know every nook and cranny of the battle system to even get off some semblance of damage. That's why I compiled this list of 5 JRPGs with steep learning curves. Now before I begin, I have personally played every single game on this list for hours. I know how to play these games. I'm just pointing out that they may have been difficult to learn for the majority of people out there. Also, I'm not here to explain every fine detail of an entry's battle system and gameplay inside and out. If I did, this video would be far too long, but I do think I covered the very important aspects of each. So with those understandings out the way, let's start this list, shall we? Cross Edge. Cross Edge is a crossover game featuring characters from Darkstalkers, Disgaea, and Artinelico, just to name a few. I believe it was the first crossover game that I was introduced to. Little did I know when I got Cross Edge that it was a tough game to learn and was almost unreasonably hard, even on its easy difficulty setting. In battle, your AP determines all your character's actions, from attacking to using items to moving and to even switching out party members. The problem with Cross Edge is that it does not explain any of its systems in depth, leading to a lot of people confused on how to properly play the game without some outside assistance. You have normal attacks, combos, branch combos, joint combos, variation to combos. Attacks have certain values to them like burst down and break, along with skill types like B skill, F enchant, and R skill. And it's never made clear in the game what these are or how to properly execute combos. It doesn't help that the game is punishing, especially with the bosses. And normal encounters give very little experience, not to mention the clunky menus, and then you have to deal with excessive prices to buy things in the game from normal healing items to upgrading equipment and reviving allies when they die in battle costs a hefty fee. And just stack that on top of the low item material drop rate for upgrading said equipment, and you got a recipe for a game that would kick your ass if you don't know how to play fast. Also, you should know what stats to pump when your characters level up, because if you don't pay attention to your hit stat, for example, you will be struggling to hit anything with your physical attackers. And then you have your vitality stat, which is important too, because if your overall HP is too low, bosses will make short work of you in a single turn. There's a lot of micromanaging in Cross Edge, along with a, I would say, healthy dose of trial and error. If you can learn the ins and outs of battle, there's definitely a satisfying experience to be had. But Nick no mistake, this game will indeed punish you. Up until this very day, I did not fully understand the battle system until I was capturing gameplay for this video. As a matter of fact, how the hell did I beat this game? This game is ridiculous on almost every level. I don't know how I got through it back in the day. Actually, hold on, I'm gonna go check something real quick. Proof right there on my PS3 that I finished Cross Edge. I don't know how I did it. I, I really don't, I don't know, 2013 Shadow Elite must have been amazing because I feel like you cannot figure out how I finished this game. Residence of Fate. Residence of Fate is an RPG that was pretty much made to be different. Using guns primarily to say we don't need traditional swords like in almost every JRPG and to pretty much appeal to a different audience. You see, you aren't dealing with the average JRPG anymore when it comes to Residence of Fate. While at the time it was nice to have something that was a divergent from your typical JRPG, it ended up being a hard to learn game. Residence of Fate throws you right into the thick of it by not giving you a tutorial battle. Sure you can go to the arena which is right outside the first town and provides tutorials that can help you learn the game, but you'd be surprised that a lot of people didn't know this upon the game's initial release. And come on, at least in the beginning of a JRPG you should be introduced to the game's battle system and not going off to find a tutorial no matter how close it might be, especially when it's something that isn't your typical action or turn based RPG affair. Once you do get to the game's tutorial, things become a little bit easier to manage, but that still doesn't save it from being hard and not a walk in the park to pick up. You have guns that can cause normal damage to enemies and other guns that will inflict what the game calls scratch damage. Scratch damage won't kill your opponents, but it will do enough so that damage from normal guns will be effective. You can break your opponent's HP bar and juggle and slam opponents into the ground. 
Knowing how to properly move and position your party is key as your distance will determine how fast and frequent you can attack. And running in between your party members whenever you get the chance will help immensely in battle. Also, always aiming to position your characters in a triangle formation will help you get started. However, one mistake could spell disaster for your party. You could be doing great in the boss battle, but forget to do one small thing and you could end up being completely devastated, leaving you to retry a long battle over again. I do commend Resonance of Fate for being different and it was and still is entertaining, but it isn't a game that anyone could just jump into easily. Record of Acarus War 2 the Acarus War games are RPGs that was released on PS3 and Xbox 360 and then ported to the PC sometime after. Acarus War 2 stands out to me as a game I really liked and really hated at the same time. I don't believe this game is newcomer friendly at all. As I mentioned with Cross Edge earlier, this game is punishing and doesn't do a lot to help you. You have a lot of character customization at your disposal and lots of characters to use. So the element of choice is there to use whatever team you see fit that gels well with your playstyle. Eh, to an extent. Sure, its sprites look good and the combos all look great to pull off, but Agarus War 2 suffers from not explaining a damn thing to you. You get your intro tutorial battles, but they are very brief and they don't help much. If you start going into the game's menus, it will provide some explanations of the screens you are looking at, but that's it, and you can't pull up these explanations ever again. And some of the aspects of battle are never explained at all. You see this? Never once are these explained to you in the game. It works like Star Ocean's bonus board, but it's never talked about. Also, if you hit an attack at the right time, you can reduce your weight gauge, which governs how often you can attack. This is also not explained, but it ends up being a really big help if you know how to time your attacks correctly. In this game, you'll have to deal with boss battles and even normal battles that will knock you flat on your ass, low item material drop rates to upgrade your equipment, high cost to revive allies, getting little money and experience in battle, and the somewhat permanent and complicated nature of learning and equipping skills respectively. Because you see, in Acarus War 2, characters don't learn most of their attacks by leveling up. You have to learn them through using books. Your characters can only choose from one set of books to learn new skills, and once they learn a book from that set, they can't learn any other skills from that book set. Because of this, if you don't plan your party in advance or even go as far as to determine your end game party in the beginning, you can really get screwed since you could end up giving characters skills that don't take full advantage of their stats. Does that all sound a little bit complex? That's because it is, and that's only the surface of this game. You would be borderline crazy not to go to an outside source like Reddit, GameFAQs, or just a comment section to help you play this game. But you know what, at the end of the day, I deemed Agarith War 2's battle system to be fun to play as long as you can get through the many hoops and hurdles to learn it. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 the Xenoblade series introduced a lot of people to MMO style combat. That in and of itself is a steep learning curve for a lot of people. The auto attack put some people off for the fact that they like to be in control, but I believe Xenoblade Chronicles games give you more control than you initially think. There's also the fact that you can't use healing items mid battle like you can in most JRPGs to heal. You instead have to use certain skills to recover HP during battle. Xenoblade Chronicles 2, like most games on this list, also suffers from not having more detailed tutorials. It's just a one and done sort of deal. Done very vaguely and quick with no real way on how to do a blade combo for example after the tutorial battle it shows up in. You can look at general tips by purchasing them at a store in the game. Uh, uh hold on, let me see if I'm uh, reading where I work correctly here. Uh, yeah, yes. I don't know what Molly Soft was thinking, but in order to get in-game details about certain systems, you have to purchase them. While it doesn't cost much to buy these tutorial pieces, it just begs the question of why couldn't you just place them in the main menu and pull up the information like in any normal JRPG? When you're in battle, you have to take note of your positioning as some skills would deal more damage such as hitting enemies from behind, you also have to keep in mind breaking, toppling, launching, and then smashing enemies to get off a lot of damage, figuring out what seal effects do, and how to pull off a successful chain attack. If you play Xenoblade Chronicles 2 enough, it will all eventually come to you on how to pull off these feats. It just takes a lot of patience and experimenting with battles before you find your footing. Oh, and did I mention I hate the gotcha summoning mechanic for this game? It may not have anything to do with the learning curve of this game, but it still sucks. And yet I still love Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Disgaea 
I really can't pick one Disgaea game out of the main series to put on this list, so I'll just say the Disgaea series as a whole. I personally love the Disgaea games, but I won't lie to the fact that there's a lot to learn. A lot of people have trouble with the main story of Disgaea games. Geoblocks, symbols, and panels can really discourage some people alone. Then you have special abilities that each character might have, team attacks, magic change, knowing the difference between monster and human units, attack direction and height, taking advantage of lift and throw. Really, Disgaea has a lot of turns you need to pick up on, but it's all worth it as it leads to experience catered to your own. Actually, you don't even need to touch most of Disgaea's systems for the main story, but when you start tackling the post-game content in any Disgaea game, that's when shit gets real. If you dare dive into the post-game of the Disgaea game, you really have to pay attention to a lot more things. You have to dive even deeper into the item world, character world, dark assembly, reincarnations, utilizing innocence, weapon mastery, rank 39 equipment, figuring out how to get to an item god 2, class proficiency, attitudes, the land of carnage, mount ordeal, and whatever special feature unique to that Disgaea game. It's a little bit much for some people, but for me, it was fairly simple and I caught on quick. Being a JRPG gold and all, Disgaea games in their post-game content has caused me no trouble at all. Really? You're just gonna sit here and lie to these people? Oh, shit. I knew I shouldn't have mentioned this guy in this video. Look, Bale, you are the last post-game super boss in every Disgaea game. Your stats are in the millions. No, seriously, people, look, his stats are literally in the millions. I could have sworn you made videos stating that you could defeat me, and you have still yet to do so. You know, I've just been busy, you sound familiar, by the way, and I just don't have time to be grinding stats in the millions to fight you. Fair enough, I suppose, but until you can defeat me. Wait, what did you just do? Did, did you just take my JRPG God title from me? If you truly are a JRPG God, you should have no trouble besting me and reclaiming your title. I bid you farewell. I, wait a second, Wh what just happened? Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, if you, uh, enjoyed this video, hit the like button, subscribe if you're new to the channel, and I'll catch you guys next time. I'm sorry, I, I don't know what just transpired just now. I have to go play a certain Disgaea game and, uh, get back my JRPG God title. I'll catch you guys next time.